Again, if you're visiting with us today, thank you for coming. We've been in a series since I arrived in August talking about relationships. We've been looking at Philippians and I've been having a chance to read some of your comments on the cards, you know, those cards in the back of the pew back. You can fill those out and you can let us know your decision if you've made one for Christ or what's going on in your life. And there have been a lot of comments. Pray for my family and then some things that um, would be listed would help us to get a better understanding of some of the stuff that's going on in lives of some of you dealing with relationships. The text for today is found in Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read through it. It's Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. So if you have your Bible or your smartphone, you can follow it up on the screen. I'd like to read it and then pray and then jump into the teaching of the text for this morning. Paul again writing to the Philippians and he says this, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again to you is no trouble for me. It's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God, the glory of Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence, even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Will you pray with me? Father, I pray this morning that your Holy Spirit will grab a hold of me, Get in front of me, get me behind him, hide me behind the cross so that your words this morning might be spoken and not my words, that what you want said might be said and not what I want said. And I pray during this message that as people are dealing or struggling with relationships, as they're trying to understand the depth of the meaning of forgiveness and righteousness and holiness and worship, as they're trying to understand how to get along with people, Christians getting along with Christians, that we might understand what it means, first of all, to be in relationship with you. And then to know that all of our relationships with others will be based on the foundation of our relationship with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, it hit me, and it is so true, I've got to remind myself, my relationship with you is going to be based on the foundation of my relationship with God. In other words, if I've got a bad relationship with God, I'm not going to be able to have good relationships with other people. And so Paul is stressing this. We've been in this theme of relationship and the idea that uh, we're all in one big boat together. And when you're in a boat together with other people, sometimes it gets tight, it gets confined. And so we need to learn how to get along with other people, especially when we're in close contact with them. The message for today is entitled One Upmanship. And the idea is that one upmanship does not make for a good relationship. Now, many of you, you know what one upmanship means, right? In boating terminology, it means my boat is bigger than your boat. It's kind of like a man thing. To have something bigger, faster, stronger, more powerful, it makes us feel in some strange way we have something up. On somebody else. But ladies, you do it too. So it's not just men. Some of you ladies may be talking and maybe you're bragging about your grandson and you're wanting to spend time hanging around talking with a friend about your grandson. So you say, Wow, let me tell you something about my grandson. And right away, oh, I've got 12 grandkids 
and, and my oldest is in medical school, and all of a sudden it's this tit for tat. You want to tell them what's great and what's going on in your life, and immediately what do they start doing? They want to start telling you what's going on in their life. You go up to someone and say, wow, you know, we've been blessed. We just got a brand new car. And the next thing the person says is, yeah, well, we decided years ago it's best to get a new car every three years. You know, they start to break. You're going, wow, we just got a brand new car. And you're telling me that you get a car every three years? And you start playing this game of one-upmanship. When we were living in uh, Louisiana, there was a bumper sticker that I'll never forget. Uh, my daughter was going to Vineyard Elementary School at the time. And uh, the bumper sticker said, uh, my child is an honor roll student at Vineyard Elementary School. Now that was just something that you could put on your car, drive through this small town of Ponchatoula, Louisiana, and everybody would know, wow, an honor student at elementary school, as if that was impressive, I don't know. But I saw another bumper sticker, same town, and it read, my kid can beat up your honor roll student. <laughs> and I thought, what a perfect example of one-upmanship. In other words, what can I show you that I have or can do that is better than you. In a way, this text is all about that. If we think about Paul and we think about Paul's life, Paul in the flesh had every reason to boast. He had reached the highest level of Pharisaical Hebrew life. We'll see that in a few moments. But Paul had a problem. And when he became overcome by the Spirit of Christ... When Jesus Christ came into his life, Paul began to look at his old life and then he began to see this new life that was emerging in Christ Jesus. And he saw a huge conflict because his old life, he based on what he could do, what he had accomplished. His new life, though, had nothing to do with who he was or what he could do. Now we'll see in the text here that many of the things that happened to Paul that he boasted about, he really didn't have a lot of control over. He was born a Jew. He was born into the Hebrew race. He was born into the tribe of Benjamin. He had nothing to do when he was eight days old about being circumcised according to the law. He was born into this. The term born with a silver spoon in your mouth may come to mind. That was Paul's pedigree. He had papers. That was his background. He did have something to boast about. But then he came to meet this man named Jesus on the road to Damascus. He was knocked off his high horse. He lay on the ground he looked up to heaven and heard the voice of Jesus Christ who he had been persecuting. I wonder if Paul ever thought why Jesus was born poor in a low blue cat, blue collar working class family. Think about it for a minute. If you were God and if you were going to leave heaven and come to earth, and if you had to choose a place to live and a profession and a family pedigree, and you're God, don't you think you'd probably want to come back as either Elvis or a rock star or some famous basketball player or some politician or someone who changed the world or a brilliant person so that you could walk around and let other people admire you and pay admonishments to you? Wouldn't you think that if you were God, you would probably do that? No, well, probably you would. But Jesus didn't. Think about that. Jesus was born in a town 
was very famous. But he went back to where he lived the rest of his life in a town that was considered the ghetto, a place unworthy to be from. He was blue-collar, working class, worked with his hands, a simple carpenter. And now Paul is struggling with who he was and who Christ is. He's writing in the text, and we're going to work through it. Chapter 3, verse 1, Paul starts out, and he says, finally. Does it seem ultra quiet in here to you, or is it just me? (laughs) Are you guys out there? All right, just wanted to make sure. So Paul's starting out, and he's saying, finally. Now, Paul is saying this at the end of chapter 2, right in the middle of the book. Now, Paul is not getting ready to end the book. So what he's saying basically here is now for the rest of the story. He begins to jump into the very important truth of the matter of this message. Now, folks, this message 2,000 years ago is just as important today as it was back then. People back then were struggling with one-upmanship just as we are struggling with it today. I don't know what they did. Maybe, you know, my camel is taller than your camel. Or maybe my ox are stronger than your ox. Or maybe my sandals aren't quite as dirty as your sandals. I don't know. I wear purple robe. You wear just regular plain Jane cloth. But one-upmanship is part of the fallen nature of humanity. All of us deal with wanting to feel we are more important than we are. And so Paul is trying to enforce in the life of the Philippians that they've got to put aside their pedigree. Their papers don't don't matter. Their background has nothing to do with their foreground. Where they were is not going to determine where they're going. Who they were without Christ is nothing compared to who they are with Christ. So Paul is saying, dial it in, folks. Listen, this is important. If it was Paul Harvey writing, he would be saying, now for the rest of the story. In other words, you got a glimpse in the first couple of chapters. Now let's dial in to why this is important. And he says, to write these things to you, these same things to you again, is no trouble for me, yet it is a safeguard. What is Paul wanting us to understand, church? What's Paul been talking about? Two main things up to this point. Unity, unity, and joy. What Paul has seen in his life before Christ is that humanity is not united because of sin and because of the self. And the nature of every one of us here, when it falls towards the flesh, is to hope other people recognize what good things we do. What Paul is saying to us today, just like he said 2,000 years ago, is we've got to put the flesh to death and let Jesus live in us. Is that a place for an amen? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure you're still there with me this morning. So Paul begins talking in verse 2. And in verse 2, he's going to highlight by using three different describers or ways of defining one group of people. And then he's going to put that group of people in comparison to Christians and who we are in Christ. So follow with me. He's going to describe one group of people who appear to be religious from the outside. And then he's going to compare them with people who are in Christ, whose foundation is based on their relationship with Jesus. Now he starts out in verse 2. Very crudely and crass or very direct using terminology that could be offensive to some people, but he says, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. 
These three terms he's using to describe those people who are hypocrites, who want to build up their own life to make it look more important than it is, and those people then are going to look down on others, and Paul's going to say very clearly, those people don't know what it means to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Now, the implication to that is very clear. In our country, yes, even in our churches, there are some people who believe they have a relationship with God, but it's based on what they have done and not on who Jesus is. Now, that could be offensive to some of you this morning. It was certainly offensive when Paul wrote it, but it's the truth. Man, you guys are quiet. It is the truth. And this may be a message that you don't want to hear because when we get to understand who we are in the yuck and the muck and the filth of our own self and flesh, and when we compare that or see who Jesus is in comparison to who we think we are, the Bible says that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. Now, when Paul talks about the dogs, he talks about the evil workers, he talks about the false circumcisions, let me try to just give you an overview of what he's saying. First of all, when he uses the term dogs, some of you are pet lovers. If you're a pet lover, raise your hand. It's okay, as long as they're dogs. Dogs are mentioned 41 times in the Old Testament and the New Testament. For those of you who like cats, cats are never mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> dogs are mentioned 41 times. Now, when we think about dogs, initially we think that dogs would be a very negative term. And if I call you a dog, then I'm insulting you. But really, dogs are just dogs by nature. They do what they do. Yes, in those days, there were hordes of dogs that would travel around. They were untamed. They wouldn't call, come when you called them. They had no respect for human beings, and they were like wild animals. They're not talking about, in these days, domesticated dogs versus, in those days, wild packs of dogs. But there was something very particular about a dog. A dog did what dogs were meant to do, and part of the nature of a dog, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 26, 11, and then Peter repeats it in 2 Peter 2, 22. He says the nature of a dog is to go back and eat its own vomit. Now, that's kind of disgusting, isn't it? I mean, that's really disgusting. I mean, I remember in school when I would see a little kid or something like that, Ugh, I go, I was one of the, I just couldn't hold it down. But the idea that a dog vomits and then goes back and eats its vomit is repulsive. But yet, on the other hand, you could think, well, that dog's just trying to clean up after himself. <laughs> right? So there's two ways to look at that. Good dog, eat the vomit up. Don't make me come and pay it up. But the idea here, listen closely. I've read commentary after commentary after commentary, and I never saw this mention. What I believe Paul is saying here is one sign of these people who have it all wrong is that they go back to themselves and they base all of their goodness on what they have regurgitated and brought back in what they have regurgitated and brought back in. Now think about that for a moment. It's not that the dogs are wicked or evil or bad. It's that these dogs had something good, gave it up, and instead of moving on to something better, they went back to the old. Now hold that in your mind. That's going to be one description of these people. They go back to what's old, not good. Secondly, they're called evil workers. In other words, if you examine what they do on the outside, it may look to be good. But once you get close to them and really examine on the inside 
what it is they're doing or saying, it's obvious what they're doing is for their own good. It's evil. They have selfish intentions. They want to get one up on other people. They want to be able to go down their resume and prove to you they are better than you are. And the idea is, if I can prove I'm better than you, I have a better chance of going into heaven because surely God is going to let the best people into heaven. Right? Wrong. Okay, you see where we're going. Dogs go back to the old. Evil workers want to consider what they do as being good enough to earn them a place into heaven. And then here's the good one. We've been talking about circumcision quite a bit. Paul calls these people the false circumcision. Now, many of you may not understand the Jewish background behind circumcision. Let me give you just a brief, not a detailed, but just a brief understanding of circumcision. When God came to Abraham, God saw the faith of Abraham and said, Abraham, I want you to be a blessed nation. I want you and your family blood lineage for all of time to be a people of faith, a people of me. Abraham said, God, I'll do that. I'm good with that. Then God said to Abraham something like this. Now, Abraham, part of the deal is that you have to separate yourself so that you can be identified as a separate people. Abraham's response, no problem, God. I can do that. I can be a separate people. Then at that point, God started talking about circumcision. I imagine Abraham, when he first heard it, he was thinking hard about what circumcision meant. Somewhere along that conversation, Abraham, by faith, believed in God. It was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was circumcised. Now, Abraham was sold on that deal. But then Abraham had to go and sell that deal to all the rest of the guys out there to say, hey guys, come on along. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to love God, bless God. We're going to be a separate people. Oh, and by the way, here's this deal. <laughs> but they believed it. They followed after God. They became circumcised. And circumcision was an honest, true, valued, honorable way for a parent to dedicate their child, the male born on the eighth day then, to go through that process of circumcision, which in some weird way that God came up with, why? I don't know. He's God. He can do exactly as he chooses. But that analogy, that physiological separation from the male body is a sign of the cutting off of the flesh. And folks, the problem is, in our day today, just like then, we get so wrapped up in the flesh, so wrapped up in what we have, or worried about what we don't have, or envious about what they do have, we get caught up in one-upmanship, and our mind drifts towards the flesh. And Paul's trying to say, the people that we need to stay away from, the people whose teaching tends to infiltrate the church. The people who are on radio and television preaching a false gospel. They are dogs because they go back to what they had at first that didn't work for them. They are evil workers because their heart is nothing but evil in intent and motive. And they represent the false circumcision. You see who Paul's just described? He's described himself before Jesus. Think about that. Paul's talking about himself and perhaps about some of you and others who fill churches on Sunday mornings. Paul continues, and he's going to really get to the point. In verse 4, he says... Although I myself 
might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Let me stop here for a moment. When I first read this as a young Christian, I thought to myself, here's a man who's just talked down about people who talk up on themselves. And now he's turned around and he's going to begin to talk up on himself and I couldn't understand that. But as I studied it more and more, what Paul is doing is he's putting forth a defense or an argument of the absurd. In other words, he's saying something that's so absurd that when the Philippians read this and hear what Paul's saying, they go, wow, that is so much like us. And it's absurd for us to go back thinking about that lifestyle. And so Paul is very clear. What he does here is he basically puts out seven bullet points that you might put out if you're writing a resume about yourself. Four of the bullet points have nothing to do with anything that he did, and three of them have to do with his personal achievements. What I'd like to do is to work through those. And as I do this, I'd like to bring in some thoughts from John MacArthur. Some of you may listen to him on the radio or read some of his material. I think he's very solid, got great evangelistic exposition of scripture. If you do enjoy reading his commentaries, they're very solid and excellent. But he brings out in these seven points that Paul mentions, he compares those to things that we need to be careful about so that we don't find ourselves in the wrong camp or on the wrong side. So, first of all, Paul says in verse 5, he was circumcised on the eighth day. Basically, he had nothing to do with that. That was his parents' choice. But again, it shows that his pedigree or his papers would read circumcised on the eighth day. That's a good thing. Now, what MacArthur would say is that some people believe that by ritual, they can have a right relationship with God. In other words, if you were living in a country or on an island that had an active volcano. And if your ritual was that at a certain time, after so many years, you had to go find a virgin girl and throw her into the volcano to appease the gods of the volcano. And if you did that, you would be thinking that your ritual saved you. What Paul is saying is that any ritual that we might go through has nothing to do with our salvation. Folks, as Christians, we got lots of rituals. We've got rituals about the place the preacher stands when he preaches. How would you like it if I preached from the back of the auditorium one Sunday? Wouldn't that be weird? We have rituals over how we start music, how we stop it, when we have the offering, when we have the special or featured music. We are so full of rituals, the warning is that we can get our rituals confused with a right relationship with Jesus. So Paul's saying circumcision, yeah, I was circumcised, but what he's saying in the absurd factor here is circumcision is a ritual. It has nothing to do with your relationship with God. Secondly, Paul says that he's of the nation of of Israel. What does that mean? It means that he has the bloodline that follows down from Abraham all the way through the people of Israel. Now, in the same light, what some people could say is because of my race, I am better than other people. You've heard that before. I'll tell you, growing up, spending a lot of time in Georgia, I can't help but be affected by that sin of racism. In one way or another, we've all been touched by that. What Paul is saying is it doesn't matter what your race is. Race and ritual, they will not bring you in relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Thirdly, he says that he's of the tribe of Benjamin. Being of the tribe of Benjamin was a special blessing. Benjamin was the only child of the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that was born in the promised land. Benjamin, being of the tribe of Benjamin, was a big deal. When we were overseas and we lived in Eastern Europe, when people knew that we had an American passport, that we were born in America or had an American passport, for some reason they were very envious of that. Kind of made me feel bad at times when I'd pull out my passport across the border, but an American passport was very envied because it offered different privileges and opportunities. So what Paul is saying, it doesn't matter what tribe you're born out of, or in other words, there is no rank in the kingdom of God. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your ritual is. It doesn't matter what your race is. It doesn't matter what your rank is. None of these things matter. Fourthly, he says he is a Hebrew of Hebrews. That goes back to tradition. What Paul's saying is it doesn't matter what your tradition is, whether you're a Hebrew of Hebrews or an American of America or whether you're African of the African continent or whether you're Eskimo of Alaska or whether you're Japanese of Japan or Chinese of China. None of these things matter. And then he says, point five, as to the law of Pharisee. Let's hang around here for just a moment. When Jesus talked about the Pharisees, usually was it in a positive way or a negative way? Usually very negative. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus said repeatedly, woe to the Pharisees, woe to the Pharisees, woe to the Pharisees. What was the main problem with the Pharisees? The Pharisees believed that if they could live their way perfectly according to the law, that God would love them, care for them, and honor them more than other people. That's why the publican or sinner, when he prayed, he beat his chest, and the Pharisee was saying, God, I'm glad I'm not like that guy. The Pharisees were so particular about how good they thought they were They kept the law, they thought, by perfection. Jesus making fun of the Pharisees. I don't think people realize how often Jesus threw in humor when he would speak. But Jesus was kind of poking fun at the Pharisees. And he says, these Pharisees, you know what they do? They tithe from their spice rack. It's like if you go out and buy some cumin or some dill weed or some salt or pepper and you take one-tenth of that and you give it away, you're tithing of that. Jesus was making fun of them because they thought they earned a place in heaven because of how good they lived. Paul says it's not about religion. It's about relationship. Sixth, Paul says, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. Paul was extremely zealous in his love and work for God. Paul was so zealous and anti-Christian when he saw the church begin to grow, he was standing there holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen. Paul made it his life mission to destroy the Christ movement. Until that day, on that high horse, when Paul got knocked down and Jesus was lifted up. You see where Paul is going with this? He's saying you can be as sincere as you want to be. And if you're Relationship with God is based on what you have done and how good you think you are. It doesn't matter how sincere you are. You are sincerely wrong and sincerely lost. That's pretty stiff, folks. And then last, he says, as to righteousness in the law, blameless. Paul looked back, he evaluated his life as a Jew apart from Jesus. And remember, he's talking in absurd 
ways, painting a drastic picture of the difference between having our own self-rightness versus the righteousness of Jesus. And he said, I was blameless. Is there anybody here who would ever say that they have lived a blameless life? But you see, Paul was looking at his life and comparing it to the law and the regulation of righteousness in the Old Testament. And Paul, I believe, was sincere. He truly felt like according to everything that he did, he was right, but he was living in a state of legalism. And again, what Paul's saying to us and what the New Testament tells us is we're not saved by works, but by grace through faith so that nobody can boast. Now that's hard for a lot of people to hear because if you're like me, in the past, I've wanted God to notice things that I've done. I wanted to make sure when I did good things or went out of my way or sacrificed or, or did something that I really didn't want to do but I felt God needed me to do, I wanted God to notice. And I've also got to say I want other people to notice also. But what Paul is trying to get us to understand through our thick skulls is no matter what we've done in the past, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we've walked the aisle, if we've been baptized, if we've prayed a three-point prayer, if we've led a good moral life, if we're generally speaking good people, honest, kind, and generous. It doesn't matter what we do in the church or how we're involved. If when the doors are open of the church building that we're there, it doesn't matter if you're a deacon. It doesn't matter if you're a ministry leader. It doesn't matter if you're on staff, if you sing in the choir, if you play an instrument. It doesn't matter. Whatever you do will not earn you a right relationship with God. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ that will allow us to have that righteous, that righteous relationship. And that's what Paul's trying to say. But yet that remains one of our main problems today. And it's no different than it was 2,000 years ago. Trying to get up on the next person. Trying to be a better Christian by doing more things. Trying to be a better husband by doing more things. My wife doesn't want me to do more things, does she? <laughs> she wants me to love her and show her I love her with my heart. Now, how do you show someone you love them with your heart? Well, you got to do things. That's the problem. <laughs> it all circular. And so what we do in our heart determines what we do outside. What we do outside is proof of what's going on inside. But Paul's saying, these guys, they got it wrong. They're the dogs. They've gone back to circumcision, back to the law, back to self-righteousness. They've fallen back on what they thought they did was good enough for salvation. And they don't understand. It's not about us. It's all about him. It's all about Christ's righteousness, not our righteousness. And they were caught up on this one upmanship. Finally, then Paul says in verse 7, he says, back to verse 7, says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things, all those things in the past, and if you were a Jewish mom or a dad and you saw your Jewish kid do all that Paul did, you'd probably be the most honored Jewish mom or dad to have Paul as a son. Every one of you, if you were Jewish, would love to have had a son just like Paul. But Paul says, all these things that I did in the past, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Paul here uses a basic accounting terminology he says I've put in one column all those things that I did that were good all those things for my tradition for my heritage all the rituals that I did all the right things that I thought I did and I put them in one column but I put them in red I put them with a minus sign <laughs> and then I got to the bottom 
And I counted up all those things. And I was in the loss. That's where the word lost comes from. When you count on what you do and you think it's going to get you somewhere, you're lost. Does that mean that some Christians can be lost? Oh, that's a tough one. I do believe that if you truly have been born again by the Holy Spirit that's come in you and Jesus Christ lives inside of you and you've been changed, Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away. All things have become new. But I do believe that there are some Christians that are lost in their relationship with themselves and with those around them. And you could be one of them. Salvation is by grace through faith. It's not what we do that's better than somebody else. Two groups of people. One went back to what they did and thought it was good enough. Paul and the Philippians were looking at what Christ did and recognized that what Christ did for them made all the difference. We're going to have a time of reflection because the reflection is going to be, who are you? During this time of reflection, we're going to have featured music and we're going to have a time to reflect on what God's word's been saying to you right now. I would ask you, what do you base your life on that makes you feel good about who you are? And what has God's word been saying to you that reminds you that whatever you feel you've done well is not going to get you into heaven? As we reflect on that, we'll be preparing for our invitation this morning.